Hello. Welcome to the live stream. It's Monday, so I'm here. I hope everyone had a good day. I hope that everyone is staying safe and healthy, which is kind of all the biggest things that I hope for people right now in these weeks that we've been having. Um, hoping that people are able to keep their jobs if they've got them, um, are able to get benefits and, and support and help if they don't, and that you're, you and your family are staying as healthy as possible. So I want to start off by talking about a few things that have been on my mind, and then there were some questions that people sent in offline, so I'll answer those first. It's kind of standard operating procedure around here. And then if there's anything that you specifically want to talk about, um, pop it in the comments and we can answer those questions. So first thing, let's see. Um, all right, so the things I wanted to start by talking about is coronavirus response. I know it's top of the mind for everybody and wanted to touch on a few things that are new there. So if you have tuned into my social media or things that we've been talking about, and, or if you've been paying attention to the relief and help that was available to people through the work that Delaware has been doing as a result of the state of emergency, you might have heard that there were housing vouchers made available, but what we've heard most recently is that there are no more available. Um, hopefully that will change, but that is the situation right now. So if you encounter anyone who needs assistance with housing, or if that's the situation that you are in, what you should do right now is um, you can dial 211. You can also visit the assistance website at Delaware211.org. And there's also a toll-free number. It's 1-800-560-3372. And what will happen there is that people will be able to help try to find housing assistance since that voucher program is no longer available. Um, the reason that the voucher program is no longer available is because the funding ran out. So one thing if you're looking for actions that you can take is to call on Governor Carney to increase the emergency housing funding in the state. Call on him and your representative to try to push for that so that we can ensure that people um, remain stable in their housing throughout this this time. And, you know, there's actually some questions that people put forward about housing. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more um, as we keep going here. Um, next thing, starting tomorrow at in the morning, tomorrow morning, Tuesday, April 28th, we are all now required to wear face coverings or masks in public spaces. Um, so if you are out in public, if you are shopping, if you are coming and going, walking, anytime you're out of your own private space, you should be wearing a mask. Um, it doesn't apply to children under 12, though they can wear masks. However, not recommended to put a mask on a child under two because there's risk of you know, suffocation suffocation or other safety risks. Um, this is one of those things where it's it's the right move. Like we know that wearing when people wear masks, they are less likely to infect one another. The problem that we have is that we know that there's not going to be availability for masks or access to masks for every single person. Um, some people can't afford to purchase them. Some people don't have the ability to sew them. Some people don't have the materials. So if you're in need of a mask, there are some groups that are making them right now. Um, we'll put a link to a form that you can fill out to ask for one. Also, if you are able to help with sewing or distributing them, there's a place on that form to fill out info about yourself. Because what I'm fearful about is the enforcement of this rule and what it could mean for people who don't have access or the, to a mask or the ability to make one for themselves. Um, so what we were trying to do is make sure that everyone who doesn't have one gets one. If, if it is being enforced by, 
local police or whoever might have that authority. What I would much prefer to see is that they actually provide masks to people who don't have them rather than take this punitive approach um, that could you know, escalate situations rather than remedying the problem, which is that if the person isn't wearing a mask, they likely don't have one. Um, but if you personally need one, there's a link that we'll share so that you can um, ask, for, ask for one from people who are making them. Continuing the theme of housing, it's May 1st on Friday, rent is due. I know a lot of people still don't know how they're gonna pay that bill right now. We have continually called for the cancellation of rent and mortgage payments. Um, we've talked about it quite a bit. We've posted about it. If um, you want more info about that, please reach out to us and we can provide some um, help there um, and some resources of how you can get involved with calling for that as well. Um, one way to do it is through your representative, state representative, state senator, as well as um, reaching out to the governor directly. Um, because again, we know that people are out of work and to ask people to be able to pay for rent right now is frankly ludicrous. Um, <laughs> this, What I'm really fearful about still is when we end the state of the emergency, a second wave of housing crisis and financial crisis coming because people um, are going to be instable and they're going to be in a position where they're not going to be able to make up that two months, three months, four months, whatever it may be of rent that they might have missed because they were out of work and because unemployment wasn't enough to get by. Um, I, we know that already that there are a lot of organizations um, who are looking for a foreclosure wave and are looking to make money off the suffering of people losing their homes. Um, what we should be doing in Delaware is being proactive about that and trying to prevent that from happening to any Delawarean. So we need to make sure that people stay in their homes so that a health crisis doesn't turn into a housing crisis in our state. Um, all right, that's my intro. Let's get into some questions. So there were, like I said, there were some that came in before we started, so I'll hit those first. Um, this is a good one because I, I get this a lot. So it's, you've mentioned you support a tenant's bill of rights. Can you say more about what that would entail and why you think it's so important? And this is a great question because like as people bring it up often when I'm doing interviews or podcasts and, and um, people like to talk about it and, and haven't necessarily heard about it as much as some of the other policy positions that I have. So the core reason that I believe we need a tenant's bill of rights, particularly at a federal level, is that we need to rectify the imbalance of power that exists between tenants and their landlords. We need to create a more equal relationship there because I want people to have the ability to their own ability to ensure that they have safe, affordable and stable housing. And right now, that is not the case for the vast majority of renters. They don't feel that their housing is stable. It can be taken away from them at any moment. They don't feel that a lot of times it's safe and affordable. Well, we know that a lot of people don't feel their rent is affordable. We have incredibly high um, rental costs in our state and people struggle every month to pay. So the, the key parts and, and the purpose of something like a tenant's bill of rights is that you would really ensure that landlords can't discriminate against prospective tenants. So one way that they could be discriminating currently that we want to eliminate is by source of income. The way that you're paid or the work that you do um, should not be a reason that you are denied the ability to rent a home. Um, same thing goes for the way that you're going to pay for the housing. So if you are a Section 8 recipient, you should not, you should be able to rent whatever home you want. That should not be determined by the, the landlord that they don't want to rent to you for that reason. Um, this something is something that we haven't talked about as much, but I think is incredibly important. Um, when you're filling out a rental application or a lease, the landlord is going to run a background check on you. They're going to run a credit check on you. They're going to look at your whole history. They might call references or want references, your past landlord. Tenants don't have the capability right now to do the same for a landlord. So when you're entering that relationship, you're already at a disadvantage with the amount of information that you have about the person whose home you're moving into or building you're moving into. So I would like to create a, a standardized system by which tenants can actually access information about the landlord. And that might be complaints that have been filed against the landlord. It might be um, times, times that they've brought tenants into court 
or filed for eviction against tenants, something that at least gives you a um, view into what this relationship might be like or the way that that landlord runs their um, operation. And we have to look at if there are landlords that we have identified as being poor landlords and, and people who are not taking care of their tenants or their properties, that we actually prevent them from even getting um, loans that are backed by the federal government to build to buy out more properties and, and um, continue their bad practices in more properties. The next piece is really about ensuring that tenants have a good standard of living. So that's protecting the right to organize and collectively bargain as tenants. So if you live in a large building, you should have the right to speak with all the other tenants in the building and ask for things of the landlord. Same thing goes of if you live in a in a home, say that a landlord owns many homes, you should be able to work across the properties that that landlord holds to be able to, to work as a group um, and demand things like safe, safe housing and updates and, and then properties that are taken care of. Um, this would also include ensuring that money is made available to get properties um, into a position where they are safe. So if there's lead paint in a home, that, that needs to be remedied and there should be funds provided for that. Um, this would also include things like federal rent control to um, ensure that rent prices aren't skyrocketing and that they're kept in line with the things, something like the consumer price index. Um, and then the last piece is really about guaranteeing stability in housing. I kind of mentioned before how a lot of times tenants don't feel that they have that. They feel like at any moment they can be in a position where they need to find a new home. <clears throat> I've talked to multiple people who are experiencing this right now, before coronavirus, six months ago. <clears throat> like this is a common story of people who have a lease, but they, and they anticipate that they're gonna be in that home for a while or have they have been in that home for a while but the landlord decides that they want to sell or the landlord decides that they want to jack up the rent and they're put in a position where they're either evicted or they're forced to move because of the drastic increase in the cost of what their housing would be. And because of the lack of affordable housing, particularly in the state of Delaware right now, a lot of the people who that happens to end up in a situation where they can't find another house to go to. So they're in a place where they maybe have 60 or 90 days to move and they're really struggling to find a place to go. So we have to um, add more stability in that relationship. So ensuring that counsel is provided to tenants if they do um, face any sort of legal proceedings from a landlord, um, <clears throat> prohibiting eviction, um, and refusing to renew a lease without good cause is another key piece there. So we need to define good cause more thoroughly and make it so that it can't just be a, a choice of a landlord to evict someone. There has to be a real legitimate reason and it can't be because they want to get rid of that person so they can put it, someone else in who will pay a higher rent. Um, so those are some key tenants of the idea of a tenant's bill of rights. There are some pieces of legislation that are happening at a federal level as well as at a um, New York state level at, um, and some cities in some other states as well. So this is not, um, or I guess I'll say this is recognized as a problem in quite a few places across the country. And Delaware isn't always in the conversation when we talk about rent costs or housing costs, but we have a very high cost of living in our state and many that causes many people to be able to afford housing and they end up spending a much larger share of their housing or excuse me, of their income on housing than they should be. All right, some other questions here. <clears throat> Um, okay, so I saw that you'd voiced frustration with Senator Coons' proposal to expand our national service programs like AmeriCorps as a solution to growing unemployment in this country and the work that needs to be done in response to coronavirus. Um, could you talk more about um, this proposal and opposition to it? Absolutely. So the opposition is not necessarily to service. Like I, I have done quite a bit of volunteer work myself. My opposition is in using something like service as the solution to what should really be job creation. Um, when we talk about these programs, we're talking about programs that provide a monthly stipend of $1,200. And that number is probably familiar right now because that was the monthly or excuse me, the one time check 
that was cut to Americans as part of the CARES Act in response to coronavirus. That number is significant because it, it is a average amount of work in a month, um, full-time work on minimum wage. So these are jobs that are barely minimum wage jobs and they are not actually livable wage wages that people can survive on. Um, they're also temporary. They last for you know 10 months and then you're still in a position where you have to find another job. You don't earn any sort of benefits or the work that you're doing, you're not offered um, the ability to contribute to retirement counts or you're not given pensions. So I don't really see this as a solution when we're talking about having 26 million people who are newly out of work. We should not be looking at putting those people into low paying, essentially volunteer jobs. We should be looking at ways to ensure that they get um, lasting work at a wage that they can actually survive on. So that is one job is actually enough to survive. Um, question from John, um, haven't heard of you before. Well, welcome, hi John. Um, can you tell us something about yourself and a summary of your positions? Sure. So about myself, um, I am a Delawarean. I've been a Delawarean for the last 10 years. I grew up in New York State and met my husband at Syracuse University where I went to undergrad and we moved here. Um, well, he was originally from here, but I moved here 10 years ago. Um, since then, I've gotten an MBA from the University of Delaware and I've worked in digital marketing. But I mentioned before that I did quite a bit of volunteer work. So I also volunteered at um, as a tutor and as a mentor for young students focused on developing their reading skills. And I served on the board of a local nonprofit that was focused on um, the rights of women and, and girls in our state and, and in our country and advocating for their rights and delivering programming um, that allows them to take advantage of opportunity and, and fulfill their rights. So as far as summary of my positions at the, <laughs> what I often say is that I think in the wealthiest country in the world that no one should be struggling to survive. And that is where my positions um, really originate from. So I believe that healthcare is a right, not health insurance, but healthcare. And I believe that means that we need to be guaranteeing universal healthcare through a Medicare for all program in this country so that not a single person goes into debt because they happen to get sick. I believe that means we need to guarantee living wages to every single person in this country. Like I said, I, I think that one job should be enough. And instead right now we have people struggling to get by to make ends meet every single month with two or three jobs. I believe deeply in our need to prioritize and fund public education in this country. My mom is a public school teacher. I went to public schools and I've seen how when well-funded they can, and when students get the individual attention that they need in schools, they flourish. But what we have in so many of our schools are, are situations where teachers are unable to do their jobs effectively, where teachers aren't paid well enough for the work that they do, where school classroom sizes have more than 30 kids in them. And I believe we're really failing um, the youth of our country by failing to invest in education. So I believe that that actually starts with childcare and pre-K and we should be guaranteeing free public education from childcare and pre-K all the way through trade school or college. Um, I also believe that climate change is the biggest crisis that we are facing as a country and that we need to step up and lead on this issue. And I believe we do that through enacting a Green New Deal. Um, and other key piece, we talked a bit about economic justice, and I think housing is the other piece that I talk about a lot. Um, we were just talking about the Tenants' Bill of Rights, but I absolutely believe that housing is a right and we can end homelessness in the, this country. Um, the estimates are that it would cost about $20 billion to end homelessness. Um, for comparison, that is the number that we added to our military budget at the end of last year without batting an eyelash. So I believe that this is really about prioritizing, putting people over profits and, to, and legislating in that way. All right, so next question from, <clears throat> let's see here. Susan, would you push for a support package for states? And we experienced this second wave later in the calendar year, which may require a feasible second stay at home. 
We know the state of Delaware is looking at a $700 million deficit over the next two years from this single period alone. Current CARES Act dollars will not permit the use of revenue support as a result of revenue deterioration within a state. Would you as our Senator advocate for this potentially? If not, what would you differently? Um, so the short answer is yes. I absolutely support guaranteeing additional money and relief to the states. I support that now and I definitely support that if a, if a second wave does come as we are predicting. Um, how Regarding the use of money currently, and it's used for revenue support, um, we're going to need, the federal government is going to need to assist individual state budgets. Um, we cannot have states going into bankruptcy because of um, this crisis. This is the place where we actually need our government to step up. And the fact that that has failed to happen so far is incredibly disappointing. And it's the reason that a lot of people are feeling I think disillusioned and frustrated with what they're seeing. Um, I think that the what it what I would be doing as a senator it would be to advocate <laughs> for um, actually fighting for that support for a state level. And I think it also has to be done for the individual people. We have not gotten enough relief to individuals, and what I think that causes is then a sort of domino effect of we've people have been they've lost their jobs so they've been severed from any sort of un, any sort of employment they're not getting the wages that they used to get hopefully people are starting to get unemployment but i know that's been delayed for a lot of people as well um and that turns into obviously lost tax revenue it turns into businesses losing revenue so what needs to i believe happen is a more bottom up support um as a whole i think that the fact that we've seen corporations get quite a bit of money and that it's already in their pockets, whereas we can't get money directly to people and we are refusing to get money to states. That is something that I see as an inherent problem with the way that we approach these things. It's so top down, but we have never seen the money continue past the top. Um, when we have organizations like Ruth Chris Steakhouse, apparently the LA Lakers, just like a $4 billion organization who are tapping into the funds for small businesses. That's the type of, <laughs> that's the type of thing I think a lot of us are sick of seeing. And I'd much rather see support that's structured in a way that it's direct. And rather than being filtered through the banks who are picking and choosing really who the loans and the money are provided for, um, and also making fees on top of the origination of those loans and the delivery of them. So I would much prefer to see direct support um, delivered to both the states as well as the people. I think that what we could be doing better as Democratic senators is actually owning more of the message in the media on this. I think what we've heard is not not strong enough, in my opinion. I think that we need to do a better job of actually getting the message to people directly on what is actually happening. And we should be tapping into networks of activists and organizers who are trying to help people on the ground to make sure that they're disseminating the message as well. Because I think what we need to do is figure out who are the groups that can push up that support and voice that support to the senators who aren't moving in the direction that we need them to and who aren't fighting for the, the policies that are actually going to help individuals and the states. Right. Um, scrolling the chat. Sorry. Jude says, I support. Thank you. <laughs> Um, sorry here, I'm just scanning here. Um, all right, so question about UBI. Um, so Jake asked a question about what I think about UBI. Um, I think that particularly right now, it is incredibly important. We are seeing in other countries, you know, over our Northern border, Canada, Canadians are getting $2,000 a month for the foreseeable future through this crisis. Um, 
on a ongoing basis, I think that a UBI is a really good tool that we can use to ensure that every single person in this country has a dignified standard of living. But what I get really fearful of, or what I'm at least um, hesitant about, and I think we need to be thoughtful about and protective of, is people who want to cut the other social programs um, and replace it with the UBI. Like a UBI is, you know, if it's $1,000 a month, that's $12,000 a year. That's not really enough to survive on. So if that means that someone also loses Medicaid or they lose they're you know older and they lose social security or we 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 don't push for other public goods um as a result i think we have to be really hesitant about that and i would be that would be something i'd be looking out for because i think that is the way that a lot of people talk about it is if we give you this money then we don't need to fund other programs and we know that's not the case because it would not that would not be enough to um support and I, I, so I would think that we have to continue to invest in the a stronger social safety net. And I think that we need to continue to invest in ensuring that our minimum wage is raised and continues to be raised. Um, Cause I think I'll, my focus would be what are the things that are going to best eliminate income inequality and wealth inequality in this country. And a UBI is not, is not going to do that on its own. I th and that's why I really think that like things like investing in education become incredibly important, ensuring that wages um, are livable and that people have the right to organize and fight for democracy in the workplace so that they're paid fairly for their work. Um, so I, I want to make sure that if we move in that direction, we don't also lose a social safety net. All right. Oh, Ryan, I went to high school with Ryan. Hey, Ryan. <laughs> Um, when you meet people during canvassing, do you feel like people are as frustrated with Senator Coons as you are? Uh, well, unfortunately, I don't get to canvass anymore, but at least we get to still phone bank. Um, I f have encountered personally myself fewer than five people who were supporters of Chris Coons. I hear people who either, a lot of times people who don't know who their representatives are because no one has ever reached out to them directly to talk about um, politics and our government and what they should be demanding of it. And then there are people who are incredibly frustrated with him. You know, I'm trying to think the last, one of the last canvassing shifts I did before we, we shut it down um, in response to coronavirus was, I had a conversation with a woman who, you know, was so was frustrated because she's her stance was that, you know, she voted for him and thought he was going to represent the people, but then he got in office and failed to deliver on that. And her feeling was that he's much too um in in lockstep with corporations and corporate interests. Her feeling is was that Chris Coons talks a lot about bipartisanship and his ability to compromise rather than talking about like what that bipartisan actually get bipartisanship actually gets and what he's actually fighting for um and that she feels that his desire to always compromise with republicans actually puts him in a weaker position so those are the types of conversations that we've had and i think that that's pretty much the three buckets that you know i've heard people fall into in my experience and and you know it it's a conversation that is kind of easy to have because that's that's where i'm at too right like i'm i'm disappointed in the representation that we've seen and the legislation that we've seen in the record so that's why i'm running in the first place <laughs> Frank says he can't wait to vote for me in September. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> um, all right, hold on, let me keep scanning here. Um, John asked a question about federal deficit. Um, so th this can get complicated and I, you know, I don't wanna necessarily get in the weeds on this, but I think the first thing I always say is like, the kind of the point I made before about the military budget we add $20 billion to the military budget and no one really says anything about it. We talk about trying to deliver policy and programs that will actually help people and lift this country up and make it so that no one is struggling in our country, which frankly should be our goal. 
And that's when we start to talk about the cost of things. Um, and that's fine, but I want to call that out because I think we accept the whatever spending sort of goes on right now because it's sort of just maintaining the status quo. And it's easy to just continue with the status quo and kind of rubber stamp and the increases and, and never feel like you're um, doing too much damage. And as soon as we start to say, like, you know what, we need things to be better in this country and here's how, how we want to spend our money to do that, that's when people start to, to get uncomfortable. But I think we have to realize that status quo for the vast majority of people is just like not cutting it. And we have to find a way to start to get comfortable with change. That point being said. Um, number one, we need to raise taxes on the wealthiest people in this country. Um, we have a, a, tax, a tax system right now that is not nearly progressive enough. Um, when we talk about the fact that in 2017, we put new taxes, tax cuts in place for the wealthiest people in this country that cost us, you know, $2 trillion. That's the cost of getting rid of student loan debt. These are the priorities that we have right now. And that's really what I, I like to talk about is like, how do we change these priorities? Because we were willing to add, we were willing to add to the deficit for tax cuts for the wealthy. But as soon as we talk about the fact that student loan debt is crushing an entire generation of people who cannot get out from under it, even when they pay thousands of dollars a month, they're not touching their principal because the way that that loan is structured in such a predatory manner, it's making it so that they can't get mortgages, they can't buy cars, they can't have kids, and they don't see a future for themselves. If we used that same $2 trillion, we would have, we would have given a stimulus to almost 80 million people in this country. So number one, priorities. Number two, higher taxes on the wealthy. Um, the other thing is that we have to really think about the fact that um, we have a sovereign currency you have control of that currency. And as long as we focus on controlling inflation in our country, which you can do through raising taxes and clawing back more of that money, then we will always be in a position to pay off our debt. And I think a lot of times we get um, a fear mongering about the debt in our country. You know, you get this ticker and this clock and it says every single person in this country owes $45,000 or whatever the number is. And that's not really true. No, we are not on the hook for that debt. We have the ability to um, manage our debt with our um, with our monetary policy. Uh, Janine says everyone wants coons out. <laughs> um, so Janine asked a question about stance on bipartisanship and and I do want to address that because I think what a lot of times people will hear me say that I, I don't appreciate how much Senator Coons compromises with Republicans at the expense of the most vulnerable. And I think what's important there to focus on is not the part that it's about <laughs> the, the piece about Republicans. It's about the most vulnerable. And I want to see legislators who prioritize the most vulnerable, the, the poor, the working class, the middle class of our country. Um, we have not had that for so long. Instead, we get a lot of across the aisle compromise. That makes it a lot easier for banks to discriminate in the lending of their mortgages. That makes it a lot easier for corporations to continue to pay you wages that are far too low for you to survive on. That makes it a lot easier for corporations to pollute our environment and and po poison people. And that's the type of bipartisanship that I oppose. If there's someone who wants to work on the things that I value and wants to come across the aisle to say, you're right, minimum wage is too low. We shouldn't have the ability for lobbyists and, and uh, senators and representatives to just kind of move back and forth. We should make it so that people who are representing us in the federal, federal government can't hold individual stocks. If there are people who want to come across the aisle and work on things like that, like I am more than happy to take a bipartisan stance on those things. What I think is that we shouldn't just be focused on um, coming to a bipartisan agreement.
it has to be more about what does that agreement actually guess. Scott, looks like he wants to sign up to volunteer and Jamie dropped him a link. So thanks so much, Scott. Um, anybody else who wants to sign up to volunteer, link's in there right now. It's justfordelaware.com slash volunteer and we'll get you set up. Jamie makes a point about the military budget that includes paying military people. She's totally right, but that is not the vast majority of our military budget. And that is not the part I'm talking about cutting. Um, a large part of our military budget is going to, again, these kind of wealthiest corporations. We're talking about defense contractors who are making tons of money um, simply to manufacture weapons that like we don't frankly need. Um, yes, people who are in the military should continue to be paid their benefits should be better, that we should be funding the VA so that they get the health care that they need. Um, that is not the piece that I want to be touching. It's much more about taking public money and using it to enrich corporations, especially when those corporations are also some of the largest donors to a lot of our representatives in our government. It's kind of this uh, cycle of campaign donation, government contract, and they continue to um, you know, build wealth for each other. And that's the kind of stuff that I would be targeting and, and wanting to end. And... Okay, so there's a question of who's someone in Congress now that you'd most look forward to working with? Um, that's a good question. I think Ed Markey in the Senate, um, you know, co-sponsor of the Green New Deal, pretty progressive. Uh, I would definitely want to, you know, knock on his door the first day and say, hey, I would also like to sponsor this and get involved with working with him on pushing forward to actually having a livable future on this planet. All right. Uh, sorry, guys, kind of a lot going on here. Uh, Larry makes a point that we need to overturn Citizens United and get money out of politics. I could not agree more. I think that we've seen, so my entire life, money has been a problem in politics. Um, it's made it, so it was how people started winning elections when, you know, they recognized they could buy television ads. Television ads are expensive, so they needed to raise more money. So they went to Wall Street and other corporations and they raised the money from them. And it's just been a self-fulfilling prophecy since then. And I completely agree that money has a corrupting influence in politics, and I believe it should be removed. If we want to, I believe we should be funding elections um, federally. So everyone is provided the same amount of money to run for office and individual donations are not an issue you know when we're talking about people who actually want to support you but i absolutely think we have to get rid of the corporate money we have to get rid of the PAC money and this dark money that you know people can take millions of dollars and funnel it into a pack and then either provide it to the, the candidate themselves run their own ads for that candidate i think all of that stuff um, has created a situation where frankly it's also hard to get change because of it you know, candidates that are running like I am, we're never going to really outraise our, our um, opponents because the people who fund them want them to remain there. Their interest is in maintaining the status quo. And that is exactly what we are running against. We are running against status quo. We are saying things need to be better for people. What you consider normal is not acceptable for the vast majority of people. So as long as we allow the money to remain in politics, it's going to be so hard to break through and to chip away at that, that frankly, power that's held by the wealthiest people in our country. So yes, I am completely on board with overturning Citizens United and, and federally funding elections. Um... So Jake asked a question about how inclusive I believe an American national healthcare system to be. Um, I think if you're in your con our country and you need to go to a doctor, you should be included in our healthcare system. Um, that is 
how it should work. As soon as we try to start saying like, um, who should be included and who, sh who shouldn't, it, that is what starts to add up the administrative costs. That's what drives up, you know, the, the paperwork and the red tape that make it harder. So I believe that if we're going to build a national system, it should be truly national and it should be paid for the, a single payer system. Um, yeah. Uh, so a question about stance on term limits and campaign reform. Um, I think that I'm not necessarily, I don't necessarily look at reform through term limits. I think that if we had a system that was more democratic and actually a for more people to get involved and raise their hand and say they want to run, that some term limits wouldn't be as necessary because we'd have, um, if we get money out of politics, if we make it so that um, more working people can raise their hand and get involved, my hope is that we could do a better job of not getting these, these representatives who are so entrenched and who sit in seats for years and years and years, even though their constituents might not feel that well represented by them. Um, as an example, I don't know how many people know this, but if you want to run for Senate in the state of Delaware to get on the Democratic ballot, it costs over $10,000. So that is a barrier to working people. It is a price that people are going to see and immediately be turned off. So those are the types of things and structures that are in place to actually make it really hard for people to jump into something like this and to raise their hand and say they want to um, represent. So I think things like that, like those are things that you don't even necessarily know exist until you start looking into this and you start seeing barriers everywhere. You start to see, oh, I need just $10,000 just to be able to be have my name list on the ballot. Like, oh, because I'm going to be running against someone who's so well funded by corporations, how much money am I going to raise? And I don't have, you know, if you're a working class person, do you have wealthy friends who can fund your campaign, maybe you don't. So at every turn, there's so many things that that tell you that this is not what you should be doing and or that you might not be able to do this. And I think what we should be focusing on instead is making it as accessible to anyone who wants to run, because I think that will actually help break up some of these dynasty type <laughs> representatives that we've had. Um, across the country. Mm -hmm. well, just give me one sec. Um, all right, um, Dan, as you'd want words with your platform, it seems like most of the change we want will be from partnering with a labor movement. Um, I think that's a great question. Um, so. I think that one of the flaws that we have right now, I think we should be working to fix is the fact that most people do not work in a democratic environment. Uh, most people spend the majority of their waking hours in a workplace where they have very little autonomy or authority or say over what happens. But the workers who are creating the product or the service that is being sold, and, and often they're not compensated in a way that um, aligns with the value that they create. So that is why I look at things like unions and worker co-ops as being incredibly value valuable. Um, I had a conversation recently with someone who was kind of um, hesitant about my, my stance on wanting to grow union membership. And they kind of said something like, well, unions, they've done a lot of good, 
there's, you know, we have a weekend and we have child labor laws and we have OSHA protections and, and they grew the middle class. And, and it was kind of like as if the work was done. And I think that we're seeing like as the middle class shrink, that the work truly isn't done. And that when you don't have a counterbalancing force to corporate power and the wealthiest people in this country, the little people get crushed. And we've seen productivity increase. We've seen the stock market increase and the value that shareholders are earning increase. We haven't seen wages increase along with that. Um, you know, cost of living has increased, but people's wages haven't kept pace. Um, you know, most, a lot of people who work jobs where they haven't gotten a raise, they actually end up making less money now than they may have, you know, five years ago because of the cost of living increases and their wages not keeping up. So that is why I really believe deeply in the need for unions, because I think that the, the need to, to balance out corporate power is incredibly necessary. I also think that there is an element of labor organizing and labor power that becomes incredibly valuable when you want to make change. And that change can be in the workplace, it can be in government, it can be in just social lives. Like we need to find ways to ensure that working people can stand together and stand as one and be powerful against a lot of the existing power that we have in this country. Um, I think that's really the way forward for a progressive movement as well. Like, I think that we should be fighting to get people elected. Absolutely. I'm running for office. But that can't be the only thing we're fighting for. I think we have to also be calling, ensuring that we're building power outside of the government as well, because we need both of those things. If you, um, if you elect someone who shares your values, but don't back them up with people on the ground who are going to fight for those things and who are going to support them and call on other representatives or whoever it may be to support those things, then that person's going to feel really lonely there. They're going to get swallowed up. It's going to be really hard for them to make change. So we really need to be working on both of those things. And I think that the power of a labor movement is, is something that we, we should be trying to rebuild. Will asked a question about how do we guarantee housing, which I think is a great question. I alluded to this before, but if we wanted to end homelessness in the country, it would cost us $20 billion, which is the amount of money we incre increase the defense budget by. So I think that nobody in our state or our country should be going without an affordable home. And I think that what happens often right now is we have a lot of real estate speculation. We have a lot of development that happens in the luxury level, um, but that is housing that only the wealthiest people can afford. And it crowds out affordable housing. And we don't have developers investing in affordable housing because they're making this, the decision on the types of housing and units that they want to build based on the type of profit that they can turn off of it. So it is not, when you crunch those numbers and you look at low, low income or affordable housing, there's not a real incentive to develop it there. So that is why I think that we absolutely need a federal investment in that development to, to again, balance out what's happening on the private side. Um, and we need to expand federal housing programs. I think we need to build and redevelop the affordable housing units that we need that will actually eradicate homelessness. So in Delaware specifically, I know this is true in Newcastle County, um, people get housing vouchers. So if they need assistance with paying for rent, they can get a voucher to do that. But a huge share of them go unused because people can't find a house to use it at. So we are lacking even the number of units in that price range that we need right now, currently in our and you hear it all the time. Oh, you know, housing is so expensive in New York, it's so expensive in Seattle. People can't afford to live there, San Francisco. It's not a far away problem. It's happening right here in our state as well. So we absolutely need investment in expansion of those programs as well as development of housing. Um, and I think we have to also look at fighting back against the history of redlining and segregation that has happened that has made it really hard for um black and brown people to buy homes 
um, has made it so that they've frankly been unable to build the generational wealth that comes with owning a home because of these sort of predatory and discriminatory practices in lending. So we absolutely have to put an end to those lending practices. Um, talking about, you know, airwaves and, and public and private air, it kind of makes me think too about how, you know, there used to be fair, um, in broadcast, you know, if you gave someone a minute here, you had to give them their, their, uh, opponent or their counterpoint a minute on the other side. And, and that is something that I think could be valuable to, to put back into place so that we aren't having, um, a single message take over, um, broadcast and airwaves. Um, Susan asked about sponsoring legislation to ensure legislators can't use insider information to change their investment portfolios. I talked about that a little bit before with like, that is it, when I was talking about bipartisanship, like I think that is a no brainer. It is popular <laughs> across the board. Most people think that if you are getting confidential briefings about what's going on in our country, you should probably not be invested in individual stocks that allow you to make decisions based on that information. Um, so yeah, I don't think anyone who is um, a representative should own individual stocks. All right. So two minutes left here. On that note about you know, like individual stocks, I, I believe there was an ethics um, investigation being opened up for at least one of them. But that is the type of stuff that I think need to be more consistent. Um, we, we should not be just letting that stuff fly. You know, I think what ends up because people, I think so many people feel so dejected and disillusioned by our government, and they kind of just assume that everyone's there to enrich themselves, not to actually help the people. That stuff like that happens. And people kind of shrug and they say, oh, yeah, they're all crooks and we move on. Like that absolutely is something we have to be fighting back against because that's the stuff that leads to people becoming disenfranchised and essentially just tuning out because it kind of confirms the suspicion that they have. It confirms the suspicion that, oh, yeah, they're there to help themselves and help their rich friends and they're not there to help me. So that is something I think is incredibly important. Like we should be calling these things out. I mean, Senator sits on the ethics committee like but i didn't hear a word from him about it so that's the kind of stuff that i think is incredibly frustrating too like, like you have to be comfortable calling out corruption and calling out bad behavior and and people even if they're your co-worker because when you don't it's what leads to voters and people in our country who just don't, who aren't voters because they've just decided to drop out because they don't believe they're for the right reasons. Uh, a ton of questions today, guys. Thank you all so much for being here. Okay, we got five left. Um, Terry asked a question about prisoners. Um, many people are feeling, you know, confined at home and they're in when isolation. Does, does that make people rethink prison conditions and, and their effects on mental health? Um, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that in general, um, I would like to see less a less punitive approach to justice, um, a more restorative approach, a, a focus on actually helping people ad address the root cause of what drove them to commit a crime um, instead of locking people up and taking them out of their community, breaking up families, breaking up homes, breaking up communities, um, which know does an incredible amount of harm to both the individual and their family that they leave behind and the community that they lived in. And you make an incredible point about the con health conditions both mental and physical health in our prison system. Um, this is Delaware specific, but there was a period where like a, a prisoner was dying in Mississippi like, like almost every single day. Um, that's inexcusable. Like if you, you 
being sentenced to a prison sentence is not being sentenced to death. And I think that is kind of what we keep coming back to, even with what we're talking about with COVID-19 response um, in our state and how we've been calling along with the ACLU of Delaware for prisoners to be released who are low level offenders, people who are not violent um, offenders, people who are close to their sentence ending anyway. So if you're within six months of being released, let's get you out of that prison so that you're not sitting in a potential hotbed of outbreak. Um, because we know that the ability to, to care for the health of prisoners has been called into question in our own prison systems and across the country. Um, that has not yet happened. There's um, pushback and, and there's not a desire to ensure that prisoners are safe by releasing them when, particularly again, these people who are about to be released anyway, um, then we continue to fight for that. And if that's something you care about, like please do reach out to the commissioner of the Department of Corrections. Please do reach out to the governor because this people shouldn't be dying in prison because of a illness. They were, they were not sentenced to death. We do not have a death penalty here in this state. Like people should not be dying in prison because of coronavirus and they should be provided mental health services and addiction services or whatever it is that is the underlying cause of why they may have committed crime in the first place. And that's really what we should be addressing because otherwise we're just gonna treat continually and continually treat these symptoms and never actually solve any of these root cause problems that lead to some imprisonment, lead to poverty, lead to people not being able to afford education. Like these, all of these problems need to be focused on at a lower level. We can't just keep churning at the top and we're treating the symptom um, because it'll never actually get And there'll just always be someone coming through the door that has that same problem if we don't, if we don't go deeper. All right, one minute left. Can I have one last question? Asks, is Senator Coon debate me? He should. Why don't you ask him to? <laughs> I'm ready. I hope so. I think we should. Um, I don't know that he will, but I think that everyone deserves to hear us answer questions directly um and have the opportunity to hear what we both believe about the issues and the issues that are affecting delaware and so dramatically so that is a great place to end um if you want to get involved with this campaign i mentioned it before but, but the best way to do that is to go to justdelaware.com slash volunteer sign up what we're doing a ton of right now is banking because we keep on doors until you know, feel comfortable getting out and, and going door to door again. So if you have a few hours that you can give this campaign, week, like, please help us out. That that makes such a difference. Like, that means thousands more voters that we're able to reach out to. Um, and that's our best way to get our message out right now is to call people up and talk to them directly. And honestly, most days you have a lot of really great conversations. Um, I love the ones where people are like, kind of baffled that a campaign is even calling them. And then when it's me, they're even more baffled that the actual candidate is calling them and they are impressed by that and they feel kind of pride in that. And and they and then I get to call out that like, yeah, that's part of the problem that you have from your representatives. Like we need representatives. We're gonna stay closer to the people. And that's why we are prioritizing talking to people as part of this campaign. Um, April is also shaping to be our highest fundraising month. So, Sorry, my husband and dog are breaking into the room right now. <laughs> Don't know why that's happening while I'm on video. <laughs> anyway, um, April is shaping up to be the best fundraising month of the year, uh, of the campaign. So the if you want to donate and you're able to right now, we obviously appreciate that. Every dollar that you give us means that we are able to phone bank 18 more people, dial 18 more people. So um, if you're able to make a donation, we really appreciate it. And be done at justfordelaware.com slash donate. Um, this is Oscar. He's new.
My old dog who I loved passed away in November and we've been very lonely without one. So while we had some time that we would be home, we figured we'd make a new friend. So he broke into the room. <laughs> All right, everybody. That's, that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks for asking a ton of questions. And this is great. I'm so happy that you guys tune in and ask. Again, have, we have great conversations. Um, and I, I appreciate how thoughtful everyone is about the policies that they think about. And my you giving me the opportunity to talk to you about them so thanks so much and have a good night bye